Good afternoon. Um, I'll tell you a little bit my, about myself and then I'll let Monica tell you a little bit about herself and then we'll start. Um, I'm at Pima Animal Care Center in Tucson, Arizona and I've been there for 15 years. And so I've seen the transition that has happened in animal welfare and survived. So um, it's possible. Um, I am their director of internal operations. So I've moved myself up through the organization and we'll go over some of the things that um, I've implemented or um, Kristen, our director has implemented and I've, I helped her with. Um, so my name is Monica Frendon. I'm the Maddie's Director of Feline Lifesaving. I am based out of Austin Pets Alive here. I've been with APA f since 2012. Um, before that, I founded a rescue organization in rural Illinois. Uh, rescue. My mic is cutting in and out. Um, so I have seen adoptions from a very rural, tiny little operation all the way up to Austin. And so um, I think especially with adoptions, I can really empathize with a lot of you who are struggling in smaller communities um, or communities that, all right, we're just gonna get a mic Sorry. swap here. So I had just said, is this one on? Okay, so I had just said that this was the only presentation I've had so far that didn't have a technological snafu. That's what I get And you jinxed saying. it. We jinxed it. Anyway, so I have um, been around for a long time. I'm the requisite cat person, so um, I think Michelle goes both species, but uh, I'm the requisite cat person. So I've uh, started out TNR and grew into an adoption-based organization, and then I moved down to Austin. And since, um, since I took over in Austin in 2012-2013, um, we've had an 88% growth in our cat adoptions here in Austin. So um, hopefully I've learned a thing or two along my tenure, and I'm happy to help you guys out, and Michelle here too. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so we'll move on to the first slide. And just a reminder, there may be some things that are repeated between Monica and I, but it's just proof that no matter where you live, it, it's possible and we just approach it in different ways. Um, so keep that in mind as we're going through. So fostering. So Pima Animal Care has sent 5,000 animals to foster last year. And that was through a lot of patience, hard work, determination by our coordinators. Um, the first little one there was my foster. Um, and I did not fail. I, I got it, adopted it out. Um, it, so it did not stay at home. Um, my belief is if I keep it, then I can't help um, the money more that come through. And this pack of little creatures right there um, are on their way to the clinic to have their clearance to be put up for adoption. So because of the things that we do foster, um, and we focus a lot on foster, and that's large dogs, uh, medical dogs, adult cats, um, we do use social media, we do um, little cat cafes, which we'll show you pictures, I'll show you pictures of in a minute. But because of the things that we've done, you can see the huge change in the years. And in 2010, I was there, and we were euthanizing a lot of animals. And when I first started, we were doing 80 a day. And you can see the drastic change as things changed, and fostering for the last two years um, that is what made those numbers change drastically. So here we go with our cat cafe. So one of the staff members was decided that, you know, what, we take cats out to PetSmart, but dogs get to go on hikes, and dogs get to do this and that. What if we turn our multi-purpose room, which is a community center, into a cat cafe. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. And of course me, I like to buy things, so I went crazy in the furniture. And um, so we did bean bags, we did the rugs, um, all kinds of stuff, and we adopted out 50 cats that day. And that was 50 you know, cats that either left from this event, or if they didn't actually find an animal in that room, 
it just pushed them to the cat room where all there's, you know, there was many more cats because we wanted these cats here that had been either length of stay was really long or they had some issues, medical issues that we had just taken care of and they needed to leave the facility. So if we didn't get them adopted here, they went to the adoption room. Um, so it's about what you're gonna think outside the box. How do I get animals out of our shelter? And this is one way here. Um, thinking of things that we don't normally think of, a cat cafe. The next is a prom. We are doing prom for cats. And it's an evening event, and we will dress up as, you know, appropriate, and we will dress some of our cats. And we're gonna see how that goes. But I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the disco ball, actually. So that was, that's the excitement I have for that evening. Um, big dogs, we have play groups. Every animal is available for foster. And you can tell in these play groups here, um, we hold play groups on the weekend. We do play groups through the whole week, but specifically on the weekend, we hold events where um, the public gets to watch play groups. And what better way of adopting animals that are not shown very well in the kennel, but they get along outside and they get along with other dogs. So the public come in and they see these group of dogs playing, 15 to 20 dogs. And this is where they want to adopt from because they can see what they're about. They have those questions that they are burning in their mind that you would normally ask, do they get along with other dogs? They're, you're watching it. Um, do they like, you know, males, dogs? You're watching it. Do they like female dogs? There it is. All those questions are answered by having these play groups. And so we typically get on a Saturday and a Sunday anywhere from five to 10 adopted out of those play groups. There's again um, play groups happening. This back here is where the public can sit and watch. Um, and they can ask questions about any specific dog that they need to know, but it frees up kennel space and it's cost effective in the matter of now we are do we're having these play groups happen and we're seeing who gets along. So these gr this group is getting along, we can pair them up in a kennel. Um, so that's way of merging animals if you need to merge animals. They're merged out of this play group. When someone comes in and says, not only do I want two, but I will take two dogs, this is where this comes into play too. We already know they get along in a play group together. Hoarding. Um, we do lots of hoarding cases and we try to be proactive. If we know a hoarding, all our hoarding cases are scheduled. So if we have a hoarding case, we assess, we send the officers out, we send the medical team out. Um, I will go out or the deputy director will go out, we'll assess the situation and then we know what we need. So we'll schedule it a few days later. And, but that also gives us time to network. So we gotta network our rescues, we, ne we network the public. Um, we say, hey, we have this hoarding case that is about to come in, this is what we need from you. And this is a 80 cat impound, and what we did was we I mean, plastered it all over social media. These cats actually were extremely healthy. It was just a woman that it just got out of control and she asked for help. Um, so it wasn't something, a cruelty case or a welfare case we stumbled upon, she called and asked for help. Um, so they were in great condition and I think it took us um, about seven days to adopt every single one of them out. Um, there was two that had um, some injuries that they were caught um, on the door of her door at home so, but they went into foster home. And so we got them all out. <coughs> Same day foster. So here are the go kits that we provide our fosters. Someone walks in and says, I wanna foster a dog. Okay, which dog? Here's a book. Here's all the ones that are long um, timers that need absolutely out. They pick one. We fill out an application, which is like, I don't know, maybe five questions of 
What's your lifestyle? Do you need a hiking buddy? Do you need a running buddy? Do you have other dogs at home? Nothing, you know, insanely crazy. And they get to take this home. And it has the food bags in there. It has the bowls. It has a leash. It has a harness if a dog is, you know, pulling, we will, we will give the harness to the foster. So it's all suited up for them, specifically for the dog. So it's not all the same. We make sure that every dog has its own package that it needs. Um, if the dog, and I think this is the one that um, could only eat grain-free, so we sent him home with grain-free food. So again, every kit is accustomed to or, you know, directly associated with that, what that dog's needs were. Um, so foster to adopt. And this is a little tricky. Um, it depends on how your ordinance is written. For us, um, our ordinance states that the animal needs to be cared for by Pima Animal Care Center. It does not state that it has to be physically in the shelter. So for us, when an animal comes in and it's still on its stray weight or on its owner hold weight, weight, um, we can get it out to foster because the way the ordinance is written. Now, these, those animals still show up on Pet Harbor. The owners still can find them. They're just not in our facility. They don't take up kennel space. They don't go through the kennel stress. They're in foster from day one. So a lot of people think there's got to be a number that you have to reach for foster. What's the number? Um, there is no number, but I can tell you this. This is how we look at it. We want to reach as many animals that are in our foster care or in our shelter. That's how many animals should be in foster care. That's how we approach it. Um, but again, there is no set number. We're all in this to get animals out of the shelter. And so that means if you have 10 in the foster you know, um, group, great. If you have your same amount of animals in the shelter, wonderful. It's about a goal. You need to set that goal. And our goal is always to match that number of what's in our shelter. And I think this is yeah. yours. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so we've kind of learned a little bit about um, well, how foster is important to increasing your adoptions in that we have to get these animals out the door, right? We can't just warehouse them and we don't want to kill them. So the other big avenue that they have to leave is, of course, adoptions. So in my segment that's coming up here, we're going to have real talk about your adoption policies. And uh, who in here is with a shelter that, and you think you're doing open adoptions? Some of us, maybe about third of the room. What are open adoptions? What does open adoptions mean to someone? Looking for a reason to say yes. Looking for a reason to say yes. Who else? Anybody else want to talk about what open adoptions means to them? Having conversation-based conversation adoptions. Behind? Did you have something? I was going to just say anybody can adopt as long as they're not on an, not, not to adopt. Anybody can adopt as long as they're not on a DNA list. Yes. Okay. Million Cat Challenge, are we all signed up for Million Cat Challenge? Is anybody not signed up for Million Cat Challenge? Okay, I'm going to shame you all later. Um, you need to go sign up for Million Cat Challenge. It is um, the first Maddie's Backed initiative of its kind designed to save the lives of shelter cats nationwide. It's an amazing free resource for you. It's loaded with data, especially on open adoption, so you can go home and present data on why open adoptions work to everyone who is naysaying or has concerns in your community about doing those conversation-based adoptions coming from a place of yes. So Maddie's uh, Million Cat Challenge has described open, open adoptions better than I can hope to paraphrase it. So um, open adoptions address reality by doing away with rigid policies and adoption applications and instead focusing on conversations designed to help anyone walking into a shelter feel respected and anyone walking out to be more educated and hopefully with a pet to love. Open adoptions allow shelter staff to engage potential pet parents in a way that elevates both the adoption experience and a pet's quality of life in its new home. Long-term partnerships are created between shelters and adopters with the shared goal of a happy and healthy relationship with a new pet. 
The philosophy acknowledges that eliminating barriers to adoption will not result in people getting pets who would otherwise not have done so, but it may make it more likely that people will obtain a pet from a shelter than from a different source. The shelter can place a cat who has been neutered and vaccinated and comes with care, education, and support, possibly leading to a reduction in cat intake in the future. Does that make sense from a philosophical perspective to everyone? No. no? It doesn't make sense to you? No, I, it doesn't make sense to me because I'm thinking, I don't care where they get a cat from as long as they adopt a cat. Okay. You know, I, I can't really, I can't really say yes. I'd rather you adopt a shelter cat. Mm -hmm. You go into the parking lot and there's a starving cat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I totally get your point. You want, you want people to help a cat no matter where they find it from. Right. right, right, right. That is still coming from a place of yes. I want you to have a cat. This is more addressing people that are going. No, you're not good enough to have a cat. Oh, we do that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The truth is that everybody in this room does it too. And that's why we're going to have real talk about your adoption policies. Okay. I'm not in the municipal shelter, but my issue is this. Past performance is an indicator of future performance. If you have a pet owner that comes in, their dog's, the current dog's not altered, it's never had vaccinations, um, and they want to adopt another pet. Come back when that's done, and I'll give you a pet. How does that affect the pet that you're sending home right now? If, if I send this pet to their... To, to Your pet would be altered and vaccinated, yes? Yeah. Okay. Okay, but next year, mm -hmm. after, it won't have heart one prevention. It won't ever have another vaccination again. And it may be being mount, con continually mounted by the one that's not mm -hmm. altered. It also may be dead at your shelter instead. Well, I don't have a shelter. I have a rescue. So if we're talking nationally, that's the alternative. Or you could be a shelter. No, the alternative is, is exactly. In the means. I don't think that's true. So we're going to talk about this. And don't worry, because I know a lot of you have concerns. No, no, no. These are all real concerns, and we're going to get to them. So let me get to a couple things. I, I hear you all rearing to go. And that's fine. I love that. So let's talk about removing barriers to adoption. Um, let me sneak back so you can't cheat on that slide. Who in here, um, raise your hand if you are comfortable, if, if it sounds like funsies to you, to bring your cat or dog to your shelter and have uh, your cat or dog spend a few nights in the shelter? No one? No one? You want to bring your cat or dog to the shelter? OK. No one else wants to bring their personal cat or dog to the shelter and have it spend a few nights at the shelter. Why? Stress. Stress. Shelter sucks, right? Shelter sucks. The nicest shelter in the world sucks to be an animal. We all get that. Um, right now, if you got a phone call from your municipal animal control and they said, we have your cat or dog, we've impounded it, what are you going to do right now? Are you going to leave my presentation and be like, sorry, Monica, I, I got to go. Screw this. I'm leaving. I'm not even going to be quiet. I'm answering my phone on the way out and being, you want to just wait till I'm done? I mean, this is an important conference. Why should you, we should wait till like Monday and then go get your cat or dog? Why? Why are you going to get it now? Because it's upset? Because they could kill it? Because it's that important. Do you and your staff give that same courtesy to every single animal in your care at the shelter right now? That that animal doesn't want to be there any more than your pet would want to be there? Does your adoption staff treat the every single animal with that same sense of urgency that, oh my God, this cat does not want to be in this cage tonight, so I'm going to have a sense of urgency when doing adoptions, when greeting people, when giving customer service? Or do you have staff that says, oh, it's 6.59, turn the lights off. I'm out of here and is rude to people and doesn't have a sense of urgency or says, that cat or dog is safe here because it's in our care. Let's wait for a perfect adopter. It's fine. I know the answer. All of you and all of your staff don't always have this sense of urgency. 
So in fairness, I stole that little bit from um, Dr. Emily Weiss, who has a wonderful paper, paper called um, From Sheltering to Rehoming. And she says, uh, she teaches a workshop called From Shelter to Rehomer. We designed that workshop to help shelter professionals learn the subtle shift between keeping animals safe in a shelter and moving them from shelter into homes. I often ask in this workshop if the participants would like to bring their cat or dog into the shelter and have them spend a couple nights. This is usually met with lots of folks emphatically stating no. Think about it, we're not comfortable leaving our pets in the shelter, but we're not, we do not always have a sense of urgency to get the cats and dogs in our care out of the shelter. Makes sense to everybody that we have to have a sense of urgency because even if the pet is safe in our shelter right now, the reality is that is if that pet left, we could bring another animal into our cage, right? And save that animal. So there has to be a sense of urgency. Even if we have a beautiful no-kill shelter ourselves, there's an animal dying somewhere else that needs you. Animals have to leave as quickly as possible. And as such, it's the job of shelters to prepare animals for adoption and move them into homes as quickly as possible. In many cases, the quality of life in a home is better than an animal's experience in a shelter. Do you agree with that? Animals experience in a home, even not a perfect home, is probably better than what we can offer in a shelter. If the home takes the cat and cuts off its toes, no. We'll get to that. <laughs> I agree, but we'll get to that. And this is not saying that we're just going to give animals out like lollipops and you say, hey, I'm, I'm running a dog fighting ring, restock me. We're not doing that. Okay? What we're saying is that, what is, what, again, we're going to talk about cats because I'm the cat lady. What does a cat need from a home? Love? Shoe, food, shelter? Food and water, shelter? Does cat care if you live in a mobile home or a mansion? Does cat care if you are an engineer or a pole dancer? <laughs> cat may actually prefer pole dancing with you, I don't know. Do you care if someone is an engineer or a pole dancer? No. You might, some of your staff might. If you don't, why do you ask on your application what someone's occupation is? No. Oh, good, good. Okay. Um, what do you think an animal's experience is like in the shelter? Do you think it's, do you think any cat or dog who's currently in a cage at a shelter right now, do you think they'd rather be in a home even if it was perfect? Wasn't perfect? I'd rather, would you rather be in a, a nice prison or in a mediocre hotel? Right? <laughs> I'd rather be in Motel 6 than prison. So I think we have to let go of a lot of these ideas about what's perfect and what's an acceptable home and compare it to what we're offering, which is prison. So I think in this country we have a giant problem with controlling pets. Um, in my expertise anyway, a lot of people want to control cats. Um, think about where people get cats from. This is a graph that shows you where people get their pets from. 55% come from friends, family, and neighbors. 14% of people, they found their cat free roaming outside. 11% came from a litter. 7% of strange people in the world somehow still buy cats from a breeder. I don't know who these people are, but I guess they all have like sphinxes or something. 5% um, community feral cat showed up. 3% uh, of people adopt their cats from you. 3%. Can you control whether someone gets a cat or not? If you come to APA right now and I tell you I don't like you, your hair color is bad and you need to get your roots done, you're not getting a cat. Could you have a cat by the time you get back to this hotel? Right? You could have several. You're not stopping whether someone gets a cat. So when come, someone comes into your shelter to adopt a cat or dog, if you tell them no, it doesn't mean they're not getting a cat or dog. They may not get one from you, but they're getting a cat or dog. So what open adoptions addresses is they say, we realize you're going to get a cat or dog when you leave here today. If you're not gonna get one from me, please at least let me set you up to be a pet owner when you do leave and you pick up a free cat or dog on the way home. Let me give you brochures on spay and neuter. Let me give you vaccine information. Let me give you our support line that you can call us when inevitably your free Craigslist cat gets knocked up and you have kittens. 
let me set you up for success realizing that you're not going to leave today with an animal? Or is it a situation where you can say, I realize you're not ideal, so let me educate you. Let me give you the resources. You need vaccines for your pet at home. You need spay and neuter for it. Let me set you up on an appointment to get that done right now. You'll take our pet home, and I'm going to check in with you in the next three days. We're going to see how you're going. We're here to be a safety net for you forever. The pet that you're going home with is spayed and neutered, so I know it's not going to be out procreating, raising my intake number six months down the road. Right? These people are getting animals. Who in here has a cat or dog that found you? You had no intentions to adopt, and the stupid thing showed up outside, and now it's in your house. <laughs> Even if you don't go out looking for an animal, guess what? One may find you. You don't even want to be a pet owner. Do you all see those lovely Facebook ads about, this is my cat and the kitten's in the sink? I don't have a cat. <laughs> yeah. Right? They find us. So even if you don't set out to be a pet owner, you may well end up being a pet owner. So we cannot control who is getting animals. We have to let that idea go that you aren't good enough to have an animal, so I say you aren't getting one. Because you cannot control that. That is not up to you. All you can do is set that person up for success, say here are the tools for how to make you a, be a pet owner, and if you're going to get a pet, I would rather you get one from us that is spayed, neutered, and vaccinated, and healthy, and comes with a support network to say if anything goes wrong down the road, we are here to help you and that pet stay happy and safe. And if you ever can't keep that pet, it's free to come back to us, so I am that cat's or dog's safety net for the rest of its life. I would rather that than someone go get an intact dog or cat off Craigslist or at some backyard flea market and start breeding it and not have access to my support network of vaccines and expert advice and spay and neuter and free pet food if you need it, all those other things. Does that sound a little bit more reasonable? Are we getting there? We're making baby stops? I don't hear as much... No one's hissing. <laughs> okay, we're getting there. So let's talk about um, data-driven policies. So I'm a huge data nerd, and Austin Pets Alive has always been, we've always come from a place of data, data-driven policies. Because this is so emotional, right? Adoptions especially are so emotional. We have saved these animals from some hellscape. We've nursed them back to health. We'll be damned if we're going to put them back in some crummy situation, right? They get nothing but the best. I get that. I completely get that. I foster broken animals all the time. I completely get that they want to go to good homes. Um, and so it really helps to look at data behind policies so we can remove emotion from a lot of these situations and make good decisions because data doesn't lie. So on the left top is a survey up in here about um, fee waived or free adoption fees. Anybody have an issue? Anyone afraid that fee waived? It's okay, no shaming. Fee waived means maybe if the old adage is, oh, if you don't have money for an adoption fee, how do you have money to take care of the animal? Right? We've all heard this. It's okay. It's okay if you're nervous. There's a lot of surveys on this. A lot of data on this. That idea that if you can't afford an adoption fee means you're a bad pet owner has been unanimously proven false by dozens of studies. This is just one of them, and I think this surveyed over like 200,000 animals. And 95% um, of cats and dogs were still in their home. Pets were um, very strong, 94% had a very strong attachment to the pet. 95% were predominantly indoors. They slept on the bed. They'd been to a veterinarian. There were no differences between the two groups, whether you paid for a fee or you did not pay for a fee, based on the pet attachment level, post-adoption lifestyle, health care, or perception of the adoption event. This has been proven time and time and time and time again. There is no correlation to what you pay for an animal and how much you love it. Who in here has an animal at home they did not pay an adoption fee for? You all love that one less, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Do you ever go out on like Black Friday and buy a big screen TV or something you got on sale? Do you all go home and like kick it? Because it it's free, right? Stupid TV is worth less than the good TV? Of course not. Of course not. Do you all though, when there's a great boot sale at Nordstrom, does it catch your eye? You're like, ooh, I don't need boots, but I'm going. I do. That's all that wave fees do. It's a marketing gimmick. It works for every other industry in the world. 
it works for us. Your adoption policies and screening will be exactly the same. There is no reason to think that a waived adoption fee means a reduced quality of home. Statistically, we know it's just false. So we can let that one go. Believe in the data, it's false. Let's see, um, who here thinks that um, black animals are harder to get adopted? Some of us, wrong. There are actually more black animals adopted than any other color. This chart on the, down, on the bottom shows you all the different colors of cats. You can see black up here at the very top adopted way more than any other color cat. Now in fairness, there are more black cats than any other color cat <laughs> because black is the dominant co coat gene color. However, they don't have a longer length to stay. They don't have trouble getting adopted. They move the same way as any other animal. And why is it important that we, don't, we stop perpetuating myths like this? Is it helping cats when we like, pick on them as being black? Not really, right? You're just kind of giving cats a bad name. How about black, black dogs and cats at Halloween? Somebody knows someone, though, where this is a thing. I don't know why this refuses to die. So uh, last two months ago, at one of my apprenticeships in Austin, I had a student come in, and um, I, I give this talk about open adoptions in my apprenticeship. And my student said, my husband is a PhD researcher in cult, cult like cultology or, you know. Um, in, in ritual cults in the United States. I was like, how do you get that job? That's fascinating, right? Um, and she said, but ironically, we have researched this and there is actually zero evidence in the United States of any cult activity, any ritual animal sacrifice whatsoever. There's no evidence of it in the United States at all, much less is there evidence of those non-existent ritualistic cults killing black dogs and cats at Halloween. So this has been debunked a million and a half times. This is not happening. Please do not lock up your black cats, black cats and dogs at Halloween. It's silly. It has never once happened. There is not one single case documented in the United States ever. I don't know where this came from, but it needs to stop. And it, does, it hasn't stopped yet. This October, um, Kristen, our cat program manager is back there, sent me a text message and she said, the shelter from South Texas just emailed us and said all their black cats are on the euthanasia list and can we help pull them because they are only made available to rescues for the month of October. Okay. So you want to kill the black cats <laughs> so that no one else might kill them first? but this is happening. Why? Stop it. <laughs> what about pets given out as gifts? Who, who lets people adopt pets as gifts? A couple of us, maybe less than a quarter. What was that? You discourage surprise gifts, okay. They can pay the fee, so maybe like gift certificate kind of things that we do. So real talk, Austin Pets Live, uh, we have not allowed gift adoptions historically, um, and I think still don't to this day, but we're working on it. So there is data that has come out. You may have seen it floating around Facebook recently. This is, whoops. This is a delightful survey that has come out about gift giving. It surprised me, and this is not the only survey of its kind, but it surprised me that if I give you a gift of a cat or dog, you are more likely to keep it than if you go adopt one yourself. I don't know if it's because grandma's afraid of hurting your feelings, or maybe grandma would have just never pulled the trigger herself. I don't know. But you are, an adopter is statistically more likely to keep a pet given as a gift than if he or she would have gone out and adopted that cat or dog herself. So it kind of disbunks this idea that we've had, well, we want the adopter to come in and get to know the animal, pick out their own animal, make sure it's a good match, and blah, blah, blah. False. Data doesn't lie, we know that. These are large scale studies. Something to think about. I assume that most of you are offering a safety net with your pet doesn't work out, they can come back to you, right? So in this instance, what is the harm? 
of trying. What's worst case scenario? Animal comes back? Oh no. What do we call when an animal leaves the shelter for a little while and comes in a, goes to a home and then comes back? We call that a foster. That's a good thing, right? But when it happens to an adopter, that's a returned adoption and that's bad. Ooh, shame the counselor, right? There's no difference. If worst case scenario is animal comes back, awesome, out you go. Because that animal's now gonna come back with home notes, photos of how it behaved in the house, whether it got along with kids or dogs, or maybe that adopter will even rehome that animal on itself and go, didn't work out for me, but my best friend loved that cat or dog. He's now with best friend and still has a loving home. So if worst case scenario is animal comes back, that is not a problem. Stop, give up this idea that all returns are bad. Think of them as you just got a nice little foster break and you came back to us with more information and there's no harm in trying. This was a fun little study. Home checks, reference checks, wait periods. How do we feel about those? Reference checks, yes? Who's got time for, I don't have time for that. So uh, we did a, I did a little math um, recently about um, home checks. So we do about um, 6,000 cat adoptions a year at APA. And I calculated that I would need a full-time staff of 42 people who did nothing but drive around Austin checking homes if we wanted to do that. I don't have money for that. Um, Dr. Jefferson would probably fire me if I suggested such a thing. Hey, I just need 42 new full-time staff members and they all need vehicles and we're gonna drive around Austin looking at people's houses. No one has time for that. Let's talk about reference checks. When you apply for employment, you put down references. Those people are gonna say what a crappy employee you were, right? Out smoking in the back, taking breaks all the time, didn't do their job. You're gonna put down references who say that you're one lovely. Yes, you're fine, right? So what about calling the vet for reference? If I call your vet right now and ask how does, you know, Michelle, how do, how do you take care of Fluffy? What's your vet gonna say? Great, I'm paying them. Great, we're paying them. <laughs> you could, I personally don't care, but you could. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, most often, A, you're not gonna talk to the vet, right? Your vet is not gonna get on the phone and humor your nonsense. You're gonna get some receptionist who has no idea who you are, has no interest in you, and is gonna go, I don't know, we saw him a month ago, um, or I don't have that person on file, I don't know. Because if you don't have a pet before, maybe you just haven't seen a vet. Um, best case scenario, they're gonna go, I gave him vaccines last year. Mm. What if they go to a low cost vaccine clinic for their provider? What if they get their stuff online? Unless it's a rabies vaccine, you don't have to get it from a vet. You don't know. Odds are you're not getting quality information from the vet anyway. Secondly, I don't know a single veterinary clinic in the world that's open 24 seven that I can call and gives me an immediate answer. So this is just delaying things. And we talk about home checks and reference checks and landlord checks and all those fun things. All that does is delay things. When you go to the grocery store and you buy a Snickers bar and they put it in the bag, when you go home, do you put your Snickers bar in the pantry and you schedule it for when you're gonna eat it? <laughs> you appropriate your calories well and you say, today's the day I have room for my Snickers bar, today I'll eat it? No. As soon as you get back in your car, you're rifling through the grocery bags looking for the <laughs> Snickers. When you go get a pet, do you wanna wait? No. I want my cute little cat now. I bought all the stuff for it. I was planning on going home with it today. I don't want to wait. You make me wait, I'll just go get one somewhere else. Hell with you people, it's too hard. What's the number one reason people don't adopt from shelters? It's too hard. You make me jump through hoops. You treat me like I'm a criminal. I have to sit here for four hours from listen to you and you wanna call my vet, and you wanna call my landlord, you wanna call my mom, you want my blood type. My God, I could just go get one down the street. That is the number one reason people don't adopt. We have to stop it. And again, that's not to say that we're gonna give out animals all willy nilly, but we have to assume that people are okay. And we have to use data and that shows us that people are okay. Let's talk about um, home check or uh, landlord checks. Who is taking all the risk if you take home, if you take home a pet right now 
You haven't paid your pet deposit. Who gets in trouble for that? The owner. The owner, not me. Shelter doesn't get in trouble. You're taking all the risk if you adopt an animal and you're not supposed to have it. What happens when you get busted? You either pay your pet deposit or you bring the dog back or the cat back or you find it in a different home. Are any of those things really all that bad? Nope. Assuming that you're taking your animals back, all we ask is, are you allowed to have the pet where you live? Yes, you are. Great, you're good to go. I assume that you are an adult, you have checked with your landlord, you have checked that you're allowed to have the animal, and hey, if you didn't and you get home, not a problem. If you need to bring the animal back to us, we're always open. This is a great study that has shown that um, difficult policy-based adoption, so all those traditional home checks, reference checks, and wait periods, do they weed out bad adopters? The answer is no, they do not. They do nothing. Proven time and time again. All of those hoops that we ask people to jump through do not weed out bad adopters. All you do is stifle people who are good and want to help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the, the question is, um, during wave fee events, you basically run out of animals, the wait fee gets so long, people get frustrated, you don't have enough staff to attend to those kind of things. Um, so every single Saturday in Austin, we have our Catterday adoption events. Every single Saturday, there's satellite adoption events for cats, where animals from foster come in. And those are all fee waived every single Saturday. They're from 12 to 6, and usually we are out of cats by 1, and people are lining up from 10 a.m. onwards because they know they're getting free cats and kittens today. Um, we get the same thing. Sometimes, it, you know, you're out of cats. I waited in line. You know, I wanted a kitten. All that's left are cats. I don't want to wait in line for four hours. To combat some of that, what we came up were little gift certificates that just said, like, I'm so sorry. Here's a voucher for a free adoption. And at APA, half of our fees are waived like 365 days a year, so they wouldn't have paid something if they just came back another day anyway. But it really pacifies people. Go, I'm so sorry you had to wait. I get it. We're, you know, we're a nonprofit. I can't hire a ton of people. This is a free event, so you, know, you can't have everything free, fast, and good. You can pick two. Here's a voucher for you, though. Come back at another day. This will waive the adoption fee. You can do it at your leisure. There's no expiration date on it. It really appeases them and goes, OK, great. I'll come back another day. Yeah, so that can help. Yeah. Yeah, you'll be able to take these presentations home. They'll be up online through Maddie's Fund, so you'll be able to see them. And then stop and grab a um, business card for me on your way out, and I'll be happy to share these exact studies with you all. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one more, and then we're going to get to the next one. People who want to chop off their toes will be inclusive and in, say ears and tails for dogs um, or feed them to coyotes. Yes. Should those people have animals? No. Should you still leave knowing why we've had to say no? Yes. And you should leave and say, here's why our position on decloying is what it is. I understand that you're going to leave here and get an animal. I understand that. So please let me give you some information on the realities of declawing. All I'm asking is that you consider it before you get another animal because it's in your best interest and your cats. And I know that you're a good person and you're here to rescue a cat today. And I know in my heart that you would not deliberately do something to harm a cat. We just have different thoughts on the matter. So I just want to give you some information for you to take home. Please consider it before you go through this with another animal. And if you change your mind, if we can show you a cat who's already declawed, Come back and talk to us. We're here to help you. Mm -hmm. Make sense? OK. So let's talk about adopting animals from foster home. Who in here has the setup in which animals come back to stay for adoption when they get spay neutered? So they're in foster. They come back for spay neuter day, and then they stay at the shelter. It's pretty common. That's, yeah, that's the pretty common way that they come back into foster. Um, I don't want to see any of those animals that I have sent to foster really ever again. When you go out to foster, I want to give you a little pat on the head and go, that's nice, have a good life, bon voyage. I don't want to see you ever again. That means that you have to be able to get adopted from foster. 
without coming back to stay at the shelter. Does everybody in here, can all of your animals who are in foster and ready for adoption, can they all be adopted without coming back to your shelter? Yes. Good, because that is not the norm. Too many of us animal has to come back to shelter to get adopted. Why don't we want animals back at the shelter? Let's talk about kittens, because they're so easy to pick on. Disease, you bring them back to the shelter, they're going to get sick. They're going to be miserable. Now you have to pay someone to clean their cage and clean up the little mud pit they've made with their litter. Um, do your fosters enjoy bringing back their foster animals and putting them in a cage at your shelter? No. no. I have people crying in Kettery when we make them do that. They don't like it. So every single animal has to be available for foster um, to get adopted from foster in your home. So here is how the system uh, works at APA. Here's how we make adoptions from foster happen. So this is Winnie the cat up here. Come on, pointer. Winnie the cat. And if you go to our website and if you want to meet Winnie, it says, I am in foster. If you're interested in me, email adopt at austinpetsalive.org. So you will email that email address. It is manned by a team of volunteers. And they say, this person is interested in meeting Winnie. They will forward your email to the foster parent, say, hey, this person wants to meet Winnie. Please get back to them in 24 hours, tell them all about Winnie, and see if they're interested in Winnie. Foster now has 24 hours to respond to the potential adopter. Tell them all about Winnie. Do you have any questions? What can I tell you about Winnie? Do you want to meet Winnie? If they want to meet Winnie, the foster and the potential adopter set up a meet and greet. It can happen anywhere. It can be at their home. It can be at our shelter location. It can be at PetSmart. It can be at Starbucks. I don't care where it happens. That's up to Foster and is convenient for Foster that way. If that meet and greet goes well, adopter just comes back to APA, fills out the paperwork, and takes their paperwork back to a Foster, and picks up their animal. No shelter stay needed for that animal. Adopted right out of Foster. This is an excellent way to keep your puppies and your kittens out of your shelter where they don't belong because they're going to get sick and they're going to wreak havoc on your cleaning crew and all the other fun things that comes with puppies and kittens. We rarely have puppies on site in Austin and in the summer we've got kittens but the bulk of them are in foster. That's where they belong. Mm -hmm. They all have to agree to this. You cannot foster for Austin Pets Live if you... So we look at fostering as um, you have to be part of the solution with us. It's part of the team, right? We're not interested in just warehousing animals out in the community in Austin. That's not what fostering is. Fostering means helping this animal get a forever home. And if you are a foster for us, you're a part of that team. Your job is to help get that animal adopted. And that includes cooperating with this process. Now we do have, like I said, you don't have to do it at your house. You don't want strangers coming to your house. Come to, come to our shelter, do it there. Go to PetSmart, whatever you're comfortable with, but you do, have to, you do have to interact with the adopters and you do have to help that animal get adopted. That also includes you are required to submit marketing material, photos, and personality info. You are required. If you cannot do these things, fostering with APA is just not the organization for you because we are determined to get those animals placed as quickly as possible so that we can fill it in with the next animal who is urgently at risk of euthanasia. Make sense? Okay. Rethink foster as capacity and use it to manage your inventory. So this is what Michelle talked quite, about, about, quite a lot about. Embrace open adoptions, stop trying to control animals, believe your data, and make your outcomes happen from foster without a shelter stay. Make sense to everybody? Okay, and so why don't we allow fosters to do the actual adoption themselves? Why do they have to come back to Austin Pets Alive to do the adoption? So um, speaking for the cat side of Austin Pets Alive, we have between 440 and 1400 active cat foster homes a year. If I had them all trained to do adoptions, I would be some sort of miracle worker. If I could have them all collect cash and funds and report it all correctly to our accounting department, I would be up for some sort of Nobel Peace Prize. Um, secondly, so there's, there's the logistics of that. Secondly, I cannot give everybody access to our database. I can't give them all shelter love logins so they can do that. Um, getting their paperwork turned in if I was on an old school paperwork system, like I don't even want to go down that nightmare of a road. Um, and the last issue is 
Fosters have historically been a, a wee bit too controlling in who they want their animals to go to. Um, I don't know how often we still hear that their seven-week-old kittens are bonded and can't be split. <laughs> and um, fosters that, you know, I just prefer that we go to a mature couple who's home all day. Uh, we had a foster recently who was just terrified because she Googled her potential adopter and he was a video gamer and so he must be satanic and want to kill people. Um, we're very protective of our foster animals, right? In fairness, I don't even process the applications on my own foster cats. I turn that over to my team and just could just do it. I don't need to, be, I, I know I will Google stalk these people and <laughs> you guys do it for me, right? So uh, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of them just logistic and why we don't have all of our fosters doing adoptions themselves. Make sense? Now I'm focusing on doing the dog stuff now. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, Dogs Playing for Life came out. Um, that's something you want to look into. Um, it's Dogs Playing for Life. It's a program. They come out. They teach your staff how to run these play groups. But they also have webinars and things like that that you can um, watch. So we started off with having to go through the whole entire shelter and finding those specific rock, what we call rock stars, which are the neutral dogs. And um, we place those in in the play group and we bring the dog that we're unsure about um, in with a muzzle. Um, they have a muzzle and they uh, there's two staff in that yard. And so we look at from the moment the dog comes into the catch pin, which is not the whole entire pin, the smaller pin before that. Um, and we watch their behavior. Um, that specific dog with the muzzle and you go from there watch that behavior if there's any kind of indication that that dog is going to run in and just go straight for those dogs then it becomes now we're going to introduce them via a leash slowly um, so there's all of those all those tips and tricks but play dogs playing for life is going to give you that right wide a range of information um, but it's tricky, and that's what we struggle with. Um, but we have slowly um, put those dogs in playgroup. Now, if it's a dog that we absolutely know it came in with history of either killing a dog or attacking dogs, um, then we tend to not put them in the playgroup. They have to have a specific household, and that is obviously no other dogs in the household. Um, those the, the people adopting have to understand this is the history, and um, we don't suggest you intermingling this dog, this brand new dog that you have into um, parks or any kind of group activity.